I think. <laughs> Okay, so uh, good afternoon everyone. I'm Lisa Donner and I'm the Executive Director of Americans for Financial Reform. I want to welcome you and thank you all for coming on behalf of Americans for Financial Reform and also the Economic Policy Institute and the Roosevelt Institute with whom we are jointly sponsoring today's I'm going to very quickly say something about what we hope to do this afternoon and then also very quickly introduce Senator Warren so we can spend as much time as possible actually listening to the Senator before she needs to go. Especially after the recent Stronger Jobs Report, next week's meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee will be the occasion for a bunch of argument about whether the Fed should increase short-term interest rates in order to head off inflation and prevent excessive speculation and risk-taking in the world of finance. But raising interest rates is likely to hurt job growth and throw a damper on economic recovery, which is already coming very slowly, if at all, for too many people who are hit hard by the financial crisis and its aftermath. What if there are alternative ways to approach dealing with bubbles and other speculative dangers with regulatory tools that are more targeted to specific risks? And what if using financial regulation effectively could also help allow the Fed to stimulate the economy in ways that deliver more benefits to working people and are less likely to further overweight the financial sector? These are hardly radical questions. Fed Chair Janet Yellen has talked about the importance of macroprudential regulatory tools to deal with financial stability and the work that the Fed is doing to put these in place. But we think they're very important questions uh, and that they need more attention and we want to dig in further. For many of us, too, putting these pieces together is part of our continuing fo focus on deepening our understanding and the public's recognition of the fundamentally important relationships between the financial system, financial regulation, and how the real economy works or fails to work for everyday Americans. So our first panel, immediately after Senator Warren speaks, will focus on the downsides of relying only on monetary policy as a tool for stabilization, as well as on the debate about the extent to which the Fed should pull back its support for economic recovery in order to keep inflationary pressure in check. Then there'll be a second keynote from Paul Krugman. And then the second panel will examine the financial regulatory tools available and consider how and to what extent they can in fact, be used to control financial risks. Now for Senator Warren. We're very fortunate to have the Senator with us today and even more fortunate to have her in the Senate every day uh, and enjoy her leadership standing up to the excessive economic power and political influence of Wall Street in spelling out the harm that does to families and communities and in insisting that things need to be and can be different and that legislators and regulators can make different choices to get us there. We've been lucky enough to work with the Senator on the creation of the new Consumer, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau a remarkable example of the difference that approach can make, and are so glad to be able to continue the conversation about advancing these important principles. Senator Warren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for this chance uh, to be able to join all of you here today. You know, today's event focuses on how the Federal Reserve can use its monetary tools to promote economic growth and its regulatory and supervisory tools to rein in our financial system. You know, the, the Fed has always had dual responsibilities, monetary policy and regulatory and supervisory policy. But in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, Congress gave the Fed even more regulatory and supervisory authority than it had before. The new chair of the Fed, Janet Yellen, recently acknowledged the board's supervisory responsibilities are just as important as its better known obligation to set interest rates and conduct monetary policy. I think the lapses that led to the 2008 crisis drove that point home with searing intensity. The Fed is now our first line of defense against another crisis. And we've made progress through Do the Dodd-Frank Act. The risk, even so, the risk of another crisis remains unacceptably high. Take just one example. This summer, the Fed and the FDIC determined that 11 of the country's biggest banks had no credible plan for being resolved in bankruptcy. Now, that means that if any one of them takes on too much risk and starts to fail, the taxpayers would have to bail it out to prevent another crash. 
We're all relying on the Fed to stop that from happening, which means we're all relying on the Fed to get tough in regulating the biggest banks. The question is whether the bank regulators can do the job we need them to do. And that raises an issue about the influence of Wall Street on financial regulation and economic policy. It's an issue that affects not only the Fed, but also the other banking regulators, the Treasury Department, and our government's entire economic policy-making structure. So let's look at some facts. Fact one, Wall Street spends a lot of time and money influencing Congress. Public Citizen and the Center for Responsive Politics found that in the run-up to Dodd-Frank, the financial services sector employed 1,447 former employees to carry out their lobbying efforts, including 73 former members of Congress. And according to a report by the Institute for America's Future, by 2010, the six biggest banks and their trade associations employed 243 lobbyists who once worked in the federal government, including 33 who had been chiefs of staff and uh, for members of Congress, and 54 who had worked as staffers for the banking oversight committees in the Senate and the House. Now, that's a lot of former government employees and congressmen pounding on Congress to make sure that the big banks get heard. No surprise that the financial industry spent more than a million dollars a day lobbying Congress on financial reform, and a lot of that money went to a former elected officials and government employees. Fact two, Wall Street dedicates enormous amounts of time and money to influencing regulatory policies. The Sunlight Foundation, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, took a look at all of the meeting logs from 2010 to 2012 of the Treasury Department, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, and the Fed. It found that those three agencies reported meeting with one of the 20 big banks or banking associations a combined 12 and a half times a week. That's about five times as often as reform-oriented groups combined. That works out to nearly 1,300 meetings over two years. Goldman and J.P. Morgan each met with those agencies at least 175 times, or nearly twice per week, every week on average. And keep in mind, that's the count at only three of the seven major regulators. Fact three, Democratic administrations have filled an enormous number of senior economic policy positions with people who have close ties to Wall Street. Starting with Robert Rubin, a former Citigroup CEO, three of the last four Treasury secretaries under Democratic presidents have had Citigroup affiliations before or after their Treasury service. The fourth was offered, but declined, Citigroup's CEO position. The new vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, Stanley Fisher, was a Citigroup executive. Directors of the National Economic Council, the Office of Management and Budget, our current U.S. Trade Representative, and senior officials at the Treasury Department have also had Citigroup ties. Now that's the record for just one single bank. Many other senior officials in recent administrations have had ties to Goldman, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, or other major Wall Street firms. Still more officials, including two recent appointees to the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, were lawyers who spent huge portions of their careers representing Wall Street institutions. This is the revolving door at its most dangerous in virtually every economic policy discussion held in Washington, the point of view of Wall Street banks is well represented. So well represented, in fact, that it often crowds out other points of view. And that's the context for thinking about the nomination of Antonio Weiss.
He spent the last 20 years in a, to be the, at the investment bank Lazard, and he's been named to be undersecretary for domestic finance at the Treasury Department. He has focused on international corporate mergers, companies buying and selling each other. Now, it may be interesting, challenging work, but it does not sufficiently qualify him to oversee consumer protection and domestic regulatory functions at the Treasury Department. In addition to his lack of basic qualifications, Mr. Weiss was part of the Burger King inversion deal that moved the U.S. company to Canada as part of a merger that would cut down on its tax obligations. Also note that Mr. Friends, uh, Mr. Weiss's friends at Lazard are giving him a golden parachute valued at about $20 million as he goes into government service. For me, this is just one spin of the revolving door too many. Enough is enough. The response to these concerns has been, let's say, loud. First, his, report, his supporters say, come on, and in, he's an investment banker, so of course he should be qualified to oversee complicated financial work at Treasury. But his defenders haven't shown that his actual experience qualifies him for this job at Treasury. Professor Adam Levitin, a law professor who teaches financial regulation at Georgetown, wrote a really good piece about this last week. He looked at each of the functions of the undersecretary position and, as he put it, quote, almost none of that relates to the work of an investment banker doing international M&A. Professor Simon Johnson, the former chief economist at the IMF, who now teaches at MIT, agrees. He noted last week that this position is, quote, the third most senior official in the executive branch with regard to fiscal decision making. And then he goes on to say, it's hard to think of any senior fiscal official from a serious country with qualifications as weak as those of Mr. Weiss, end quote. Professor Levitin and Professor Johnson are right. I worked at Treasury, and I know how critical this position is to financial regulation issues. Despite what some of Weiss's supporters have said, the job isn't just to peddle U.S. Treasuries to foreign investors. And even if it were, Weiss is a corporate deal maker, not a bond trader. Professor Levitin makes another good point about this. It, quoting Professor Levitin again, the shock of Mr. Weiss's supporters that anyone would dare question his suitability reflects an unspoken assumption that anyone from Wall Street is, of course, expert in all things financial. That's hooey, end quote. I agree. We'd all scratch our heads if the president nominated a theoretical physicist to be the Surgeon General just because she had a background in science. It's no less puzzling for the president to nominate an international merger specialist to handle largely domestic economic issues at Treasury because he has a background in finance. Second, why supporters say that Burger King isn't a classic inversion deal? Okay, so when Burger King moved to Canada in a deal that would lower its taxes, I guess it was an unclassic inversion deal. Got it. But let's be clear. In August and September of this year, more than 2,600 news stories mentioned Burger King in the context of tax inversions. There has been some debate over the details. People disagree about what the exact implications will be for Burger King and whether their taxes will go down a little or go down a lot. But no matter how many Burger King executives line up in the newspapers to say that they had other motives, this is an inversion deal, and Mr. Weiss was right in the middle of it. Now, this matters 
because at the end of the day, the administration undercuts its own opposition to this practice by nominating someone to a high-profile cross, who was involved in a high-profile cross-border inversion, and who, by the way, made $15 million in the last two years working for Lazard, a firm that did three of the four major announced inversions. And by the way, Lazard isn't an American company anymore either. It already moved to Bermuda to cut its taxes. Third, and maybe you can help me understand this, this argument, People say opposition to Mr. Weiss is unreasonable because, wait for it, he likes poetry. I'm actually not kidding on this one. Supposedly, because he helps publish a literary magazine called the Paris Review, we should trust that he will zealously pursue financial reform. Now, I confess, I don't read many literary magazines, but really? Um, if he liked monster truck racing, would that show that he supported Wall Street bailouts? Um, I don't get what his hobby has to do with overseeing consumer protection and domestic regulatory functions at the Treasury Department. So what is this really all about? Why call out the cavalry for a guy whose experience doesn't match the job he's been nominated on? Why circle the wagons around a guy who's picking up $20 million to take on a public service job? It's all about the revolving door, that well-oiled mechanism that sends Wall Street executives to make policies in the government and sends government policymakers straight back to Wall Street. Weiss defenders are all in, loudly defending the revolving door and telling America how lucky we are that Wall Street is willing to run the economy and the government. In fact, Weiss supporters even defend the golden parachutes like the $20 million payment that Weiss will receive from Lazard to take this government job. Why? They say it is an important tool in making sure that Wall Street executives will continue to be willing to run government policy making. Now, if that sounds ridiculous to you, you are not alone. Sheila Baer, a Republican and the former head of the FDIC, responded that, quote, only in the wonderland of Wall Street logic could one argue that this looks like anything other than a bribe, end quote. She went on, we want people entering public service because they want to serve the public. Frankly, if they need a $20 million incentive, I'd rather they stay away. Why does the revolving door matter? Well, because it means that too much of the time, the wind just blows from the same direction. Time after time in government, the Wall Street view prevails. And time after time, conflicting views are crowded out. Consider the deregulation of the banking industry in the 1980s and 90s, followed by the no-strings-attached bank bailouts in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, and most recently, the anemic efforts to help homeowners who had been systematically cheated by financial giants. The wind always blows in the same direction. The impact of the revolving door can sometimes be subtle. No one likes to ignore phone calls from former colleagues, and no one likes to advance policies that could hurt future employers. Relationships matter, and anyone who doubts that Wall Street's outsized influence in Washington has watered down our government's approach toward still too big to fail banks has their eyes deliberately closed. Take one example. Brown Kaufman was a proposed amendment to the Dodd-Frank Act that would have broken up the nation's largest financial institutions. That amendment might have passed, but it ran into powerful opposition from an alliance between Wall Streeters in government and Wall Streeters still on Wall Street. The hand-in-hand -hand between Treasury officials and Wall Street executives on this was not subtle. A senior Treasury official 
publicly acknowledged it at the time. The revolving door rips the heart out of public service. Too many people get jobs based on who they know, not what they know. Too many others who might have brought a different perspective to this work get crowded out. I know that there are experienced and innovative people in the financial industry who are qualified for top economic positions in government. Look, when I set up the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, I interviewed, I hired, and I worked alongside many people with Wall Street experience, and I was glad to do so. In the Senate, I have voted for plenty of nominees with Wall Street experience, but we need a balance. Not every person who swoops in through the revolving door should be offered a top job without some serious cross-examination. Qualifications matter, and Weiss doesn't have them. This is about building counter-pressure on the Wall Street bankers. Members of Congress, their staffs, and the regulatory agencies are going to hear the Wall Street perspective loud and clear each and every minute of each and every day. That isn't going to change. But we need a real mix of people in the room when decisions are made. When the president has an opportunity to decide who will be at the financial decision-making table, he should think about who knows the economics of job creation, about community banks and access to financing for small business, about who has the skills and determination to make sure that the biggest banks can't take down our economy again. The titans of Wall Street have succeeded in pushing government policies that made mega banks rich beyond imagination while leaving working families to struggle from payday to payday. So long as the revolving door keeps spinning, government policies will continue to favor Wall Street over Main Street. I hope you will join me in saying, Enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Josh Bivens. I work at the Economic Policy Institute. Uh, I want to start first by welcoming people to the event, um, but also because we wanted to maximize the time for Senator Warren, I'm also going to present not just my own thoughts as a member of this first panel, but also take on kind of the welcome chore of trying to frame why we think the topics being addressed today are, are so important and are going to be such big questions going forward in the economy. Um, and they're important first because the economy remains far from fully recovered from the Great Recession, and I think the gap between today and what a healthy economy looks like is often um, underestimated. And so, trying to make this move. Can we get the first slide? Sorry about that. Um, so this is basically just, just one measure of it. And basically, in terms of employment conditions, 
my best estimate is that we're probably about halfway recovered from the Great Recession. This is the share of adults between the ages of 25 and 54 who have a job. Um, lots of complexity in how you measure some measures of labor market conditions. This is prime age adults. They have really strong labor force attachments. They didn't decide in 2008 to all just take vacations or take an extended time off. They lost their job because of insufficient demand and they've only recovered less than half. And so I think this is just one measure of you know, how much slack remains in the economy. Um, and the issues we'll raise today are important as well because the Fed has been the only macroeconomic policymaking institution that has been consistently and aggressively targeting a return to full recovery pretty much from the minute the Great Recession began. And in recent years, they faced some really large headwinds from other policymakers' failures, and particularly Congress. And basically, our fiscal policy at this point, you know, you've got two tools of macroeconomic stabilization. You have fiscal policy and monetary policy. Fiscal policy at this point in the recovery has been radically different and radically destructive to growth um, compared to recoveries from pretty much every other post-war recession in U.S. history. Um, can I get the next slide? Thank you. And to say this really plainly, if federal spending had grown after the Great Recession along the same trajectory that characterized its growth following the recessions of the early 2000s, the early 1990s, or yes, even the early 1980s when Ronald Reagan was president, if spending since the Great Recession had just matched those trajectories, we would have hundreds of billions of dollars of additional federal spending today, and we would be fully recovered from the Great Recession, hands down. What has kept recovery from happening is the historically different, the historically unprecedented degree of fiscal austerity we've been dealing with. Yes, the Recovery Act in 2009 was hugely important. It broke the back of the recession. It provided for decent growth for about two years after its passage. But with the debt ceiling showdown and the resulting Budget Control Act of 2011, we have throttled spending and hence economic growth to a degree that people really haven't appreciated enough. No, we haven't embraced sort of Spanish and Greek levels of austerity, but we have embraced austerity that is unprecedented relative to our own economic history. So today, monetary policy is the only tool of macro stabilization that, that we have going. And it's actually a pretty weak tool when the economy remains sluggish even after six years of conventional short-term interest rates being stuck at zero, something economists sometimes like to call the liquidity trap. But it's important because a weak positive is a lot better than a powerful negative, like from fiscal policy. And also monetary policy is directed by essentially Janet Yellen, um, not by John Boehner and Mitch McConnell. And so at least we have some chance of evidence providing an input into the decisions being made in that realm. And so that's a big part of what this panel, the panels today are gonna be about, insisting that evidence, not vague conventional wisdom, not outdated economic dogma, but, but evidence be the deciding factor in governing how the Fed makes decisions. There's a chorus of pretty influential voices, including regional Federal Reserve Bank presidents, um, that have insisting that monetary policy should join fiscal policy in trying to restrain growth in the name of fighting inflationary pressures. Um, and that's, I think, part of what our first panel will talk about. The second panel is going to address sort of a new reason why the Fed should restrain growth. It's you need to restrain growth because we don't believe financial regulation can work and only sort of hurting the overall economy can keep bubbles from happening. I think the second panel is going to address that really well. So I'm going to focus on the first. Um, wages have been rising about 2 to 2.3 percent for the past four years. Nominal wages, not real, not inflation adjusted. Nominal wages have been rising about 2 to 2.3 percent. Um, and there's very little evidence of any upturn going on. And so let's, let's put this number in some perspective. Trend productivity growth is about 1.5 to 2 percent. The Fed's price inflation target is about 2 percent. I think lots of us think that's too low a target. That's fine. We'll, we'll take it as given for now. Wage growth of 2%, what we're seeing today, combined with trend productivity growth of 2%, puts zero upward pressure on wages. It is consistent with zero inflation. Yes, hourly wages are 2% higher every year, but output per hour rises by 2% every year, so the price per unit of output does not budge. And so basically, we are seeing wage growth today and over the past four years that's consistent with about zero price inflation. Um, so if the Fed is serious about its 2% inflation target, this means that wages should grow about 3.5%, 4% in trend, almost twice as fast as they're rising today. 
And further, the share of domestic income going to workers rather than capital owners plummeted in the early stages of this recovery and hasn't recovered at all since. So this means we need a long period of wages going faster than trend to claw back some of that share of national income that workers lost during the early stages of recovery. So nominal wages, price targets, productivity, lots of stuff. We've tried to boil it down in this chart right here that, you, that you're seeing. That bottom line, the sort of the, the squiggly one, um, that, that's actual hourly wages and levels. And then the line that goes above it is sort of what these wages would be if they had grown at the 35 to 4% wage target that's consistent with the Fed's 2% price level and trend productivity growth and a stable labor share. That, that cumulative gap between these two lines, uh, this is basically where wages need to be to not only be consistent with 2% inflation and trend productivity, but actually to get back the share of national income that has gone away from wages since the recovery began. Um, you do the math on this, you basically realize we could have 10 years of nominal wage growth of about 4.5%, well over double what we're seeing today, before we regained pre-Great Recession levels of labor share. And so the idea that people are going to look at one month of wage data that's running in the two to two and a half and say, ah, inflation is right around the corner and we need to get ahead of this. I mean, that, where could this belief possibly be coming from? And so I think that's where I'm mostly going to end. I'm going to say a couple words about where this belief is coming from and it's nowhere useful and it should be changed. Um, before the crisis of the Great Recession, sort of the, the more and more macroeconomists signed on to an incorrect consensus that said macro policy should really be about setting a very low inflation target, 1% to 2%, and all you need to do to keep the economy healthy and keep that inflation target is have the Federal Reserve move short-term interest rates a little bit. Um, some people, sort of older school people who got educated back when we talked about a, a dual mandate, say, what about the dual mandate and what about unemployment? Not really a concern. I mean, if you occasionally had to lower interest rates a little bit to get unemployment down, you could do that. But you have to be really careful because inflation is always looking to get its nose under the tent and wages are always looking to just take off. Um, and today's inflation hawks, you'll know, they love metaphors like you have to shoot ahead of the duck in terms of justifying the fact that you say there's no inflation in the data and they go, oh, but it's coming. You have to shoot ahead of the duck. Um, you know, metaphors are nice, but, but data and economic reasoning are, are better. Um, and so our first panel is going to assess this overall policy wisdom about abandoning all tools except short-term interest rates for macroeconomic stability. And I'm just going to end by talking about, you know, I come from someone who lives in the D.C. policy world and thinks way too much short-term day-to-day. And to me, the most important bit that needs reassessment is this idea that wages are always looking to leap ahead of productivity growth and push prices through the roof. Um, and you've got the chart right there. This is real wage growth. So this is average annual real wage growth for three periods, 1979 to 1995, 2002 to 2007, 2007 to 2013. The thing to note is that the bottom 70% of wage earners in those 27 years saw zero or outright negative real hourly wage growth in these 27 years. This does not look like irresistible wage pressure. Wage is always looking to surge forward. Um, that's not what that chart looks like to me. If we go to the next chart though, I did leave out a period. I left out the period from 1995 to 2001. This period actually saw across the board wage growth. Um, what was unusual about that period? Well, that was a period where the Fed actually decided to not let economic dogma and economic metaphors about shooting ahead of the duck trump the data showing that inflation was not happening. And they actually allowed unemployment to go down to 4% for two solid years. And what did we get? Did you remember hearing about the great inflation of the late 1990s? It did not happen. What did happen was across the board wage growth for the first time in a generation. So there's a lot at stake here. But I think what we need to know is that widespread wage growth requires very low rates of unemployment. And the last generation of economic life does not support the idea that the Fed needs to be super vigilant about fighting phantom hypothetical forthcoming inflation pressures. They should actually see them in the data before acting. And we also need to figure out how to not, how to not let future recessions do so much damage on the American economy. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob Poland from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Bob, I, this was not working for me. You should give it a try. <laughs> So, I, this doesn't work? Or do? Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me, and I want to talk about, uh, about Fed policy and uh, thinking more broadly about Fed policy. So, Josh made it very clear 
that um, we, we have gotten some good news, uh, certainly this past uh, week on, on uh, jobs, but uh, we need to consider these in a broader context. So uh, Josh already gave a good background on uh, the considering what's happened in a broader context of, of wage and employment trends uh, relative to prior to the recession. Uh, the other factor in, in thinking about where we are now and uh, the experience of the Great Recession is to extract some lessons uh, from the Great Recession and enabling us to think more sharply about uh, Federal Reserve policy. And what I want to try to uh, argue for is to think about using the broader tools that are available to the Fed that were clearly uh, deployed by the Fed in order to bail out Wall Street to think about these tools in a way uh, to achieve a broader and more sustainable recovery. So uh, the first uh, picture there, uh, let's see, can I go over there and point or is, are we recording? Huh? You can do that. Uh, so that even by um, mid-2011, uh, 
it's a, uh, the bond rate is at 6.1%, which is not much lower than the rate it was in uh, 2007, before the Fed had undertaken any of these policies. So when the Fed was running the federal funds rate at 5.3%, and we had a 6.6% uh, uh, BAA bond rate, uh, so that by the you know, mid-2011, when the federal funds rate is at zero, we still have in, in a range of 6, 6.5%. Uh, so what uh, the point is that the uh, as aggressively as the Fed acted with respect to the federal funds rate, its capacity to influence the whole complex of interest rates is uh, limited. And it's a very important lesson. Now, a second uh, uh, pattern that I want to stress here is what's happened to uh, credit availability for non-corporate businesses. So the, in, in the flow of funds accounts, we don't have data on small businesses per se, but we have data on corporate versus non-corporate, non-financial businesses. So what I'm showing here is the pattern for um, non-corporate business. So this is 2007, so right before the crisis, uh, non-corporate uh, borrowing was $514 billion overall, aggregate. And, uh, you know, by the uh, middle of the recession, it collapses to negative 200. So uh, the, the non-corporate businesses are paying back to, uh, uh, to the tune of 200 billion more than they're taking in at all. So, uh, of course, the non-corporate business world, the small business world, uh, remains in a severe slump because they don't have access to credit. Now, what we see here is the, the pace of the recovery here. Now, Josh showed us some really important data with respect to the labor market. These are data with respect to availability of credit for non-corporate borrowers. And what we see here, even by this, the most recent quarterly data for uh, the current year, 2014, we're still at $193 billion. By the way, these are all in real dollars, 2014 dollars. So we're still, uh, this is now seven years after the uh, downturn, after the crisis started, we're still at less than half of the level of uh, credit availability to effectively smaller businesses. Now, one of the arguments, and this is an entirely legitimate argument, is of course, well, of course, during the recession, um, the businesses aren't able to borrow, and uh, the uh, banks see excessive risk and they don't want to lend. There is some truth to that. But there also was significant credit rationing going on. And I want to just briefly quote from um, a study by the uh, Pepperdine uh, School of Business 2011 survey, which says that uh, as of 2011, 95% of small business owners reported wanting to execute a growth strategy but only 53% were obtaining the funding they needed to execute their strategy. At the same time, bankers were reporting that they were rejecting 60% of their loan application. This is a 2011 survey. Now, the Fed itself uh, conducts their own surveys every five years, and in the 2012 survey, the, um, it's called the Report to Congress on the Availability of Credit to Small Businesses. The results of that survey are effectively the same as the ones uh, from Pepperdine in 2011. So uh, the, the Fed is, again, conducting a very aggressive policy with one tool, the federal funds rate, but uh, the tool is not getting credit into the small businesses. And as we know, small businesses are more labor intensive. Uh, per dollar of expenditure, you're going to get more jobs by expanding that sector. Okay, now, a, a third critical pattern is that because of the quantitative easing policy through which uh, the Fed was purchasing government bonds uh, from banks and elsewhere, uh, what we have is this massive, unprecedented increase in uh, cash reserves being held by commercial banks. And this this is in 2007, the level of cash reserves held by, uh, by the commercial banks was uh, $20 billion. That's for the whole sector, $20 billion. Uh, and it starts, to, by 2008, it's up to $940 billion. Uh, by the most current data, the current data of, uh, from the Fed, we're now $2.5 trillion 
in cash reserves being held by the commercial banks. This is not government bonds, these are cash reserves. That's 15% of US GDP. So the, the uh, equivalent of 15% of US GDP is being held uh, as reserves. Now, there's arguments as, well, this was, this is not a policy tool, and just because the, the banks have reserves doesn't mean they have to lend. Of course, they have to be, in, they have to see profit opportunities for lend. That's all true. Plus, they should, they need to have a cushion uh, to, uh, in, in order to stabilize themselves when there's a, the next liquidity crisis. All true. But we've got to keep in mind, we're talking about 15% of U.S. GDP. All, if we, if we locked off 10% of it, if we lock off, so that's still $250 billion, that's more than half of one year of the entire stimulus program, the ARRA, which is $400 billion a year. And what we can do is think about creative ways to channel something equivalent to that level of credit into small businesses, into infrastructure activities, and the Fed can play a critical role here. So to wrap up, I just want to remind our, our, all of us uh, about the creative things that the Fed did do during the crisis focused on bailing out Wall Street that were unconventional policy, uh, monetary policy interventions. That is, they expanded lending facilities to mortgage brokers, money market funds, and insurance companies. Now, so let's think about some creative things that the Fed could do now to channel credit into productive activities, into job generating activities, uh, into expanding opportunities for small business. One, which has been proposed by a lot of people, is to uh, impose the, something like an excess reserve tax uh, or, uh, or a maximum reserve requirement. If we call it a maximum reserve requirement, uh, the Fed can do that tomorrow. They can vote it in tomorrow. It's within, uh, you know, it's, it's within their mandate. Uh, and what, what is the rate at which they, they need to do that in order to start channeling funds uh, out of this excess level of reserves? I don't know what that level is, but we, you start imposing it, and you see what the response is, and you see the extent to which you're able to shift incentives. Now, what would we do with those funds? Well, one thing, we can think about ways to subsidize credit back into small, into small businesses. As we see, seven years after the crisis, the level of credit for small businesses is less than half. Seven years after the crisis, the level of business to, uh, credit to small businesses is less than half. We can do that through, we can set up a facility through our existing policy uh, framework, the Small Business Administration. We can expand loan guarantee. You have, as it is, you have about $150 billion of outstanding loan guarantees to small businesses now through the Small Business Administration and the Export Import Bank. You could double that. If you double that and you make some very plausible assumptions about uh, default rates, I, I can go through it if you want. But the basic point is, you're going to impact the uh, federal budget by like one quarter of one percent. Now, some other things that the Fed could do, and I will wrap up. The Fed, within its mandate, Article 14 of the Federal Reserve Act, can make direct loans to municipalities now. They can only do short-term loans, but they can make loans, they can buy municipal bonds now. The, the Fed can buy municipal bonds now, and municipalities can set up facilities for small businesses in their community, or they can support infrastructure projects or uh, clean energy projects that would uh, channel credit jobs into communities. And I'll end just on one anecdote. Uh, I was involved in 2010 uh, at a conference at the, at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland on green recovery at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, and we talked about ways through which uh, you can start stimulating investment in the green economy in Cleveland during the uh, depths of the recession, and uh, this kind of idea came up. Uh, the Fed has the power to, to pursue this. They didn't. They haven't, but they can. So there's a lot of opportunity there. The, the funds are available. 
We need more powerful tools. We need the Fed to be aggressive, not just in supporting Wall Street and bailing out Wall Street, but channeling credit into productive activity. Thanks. Hi. Um, can I get my, my next, yeah, my slides up here? Uh, so, um, as, as Josh said, um, the immediate danger, the immediate uh, problem we face in debates about macroeconomic policy is, uh, oh, my name, I forgot to put my name on the top slide. I'm Josh Mason, J.W. Mason of John Jay College and the Roosevelt Institute Financial uh, financialization project. Um, as Josh said, the immediate danger that we face in, in sort of the debates about macroeconomic policy is this pressure to move towards contractionary policy uh, too soon, to, 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 to this sort of desperate flailing around for excuses to shift towards uh, more, more uh, higher interest rates or other forms of contractionary policy, this sort of, sort of frantic search for evidence of overheating in an economy that really quite evidently still has an enormous amount of slack left, and, and this, this, this sort of effort to find new and original arguments for why uh, we need tighter policy now. Uh, obviously, the one that Josh mentioned, which has been getting more attention lately, is the notion that we need tighter monetary policy as a tool for uh, stabilizing the financial system, as a tool for preventing future asset bubbles. Um, I think uh, Elizabeth Warren is absolutely right, Senator Warren is absolutely right, that the Fed has the tools already to uh, limit the kind of irresponsible lending that, that fuels bubbles without the need to raise interest rates in a way that could be destructive to the rest of the economy. And in the second panel today, people will be talking, I think, about some of those tools. But I, I think also if you take a step back and you think about